Between the past and the present, um, there was, unbeknown to us at the time, a beautiful heavenly midpoint, which you can probably say is somewhere from 1997 to the sort of mid-2000s, as Joni Mitchell probably said, I think. You never know what you've got till it's gone. Um, that time when the internet was kind of flourishing, people were just trying out all kinds of creative, weird things on the internet. We often made fun of them for making their strange cat-based websites, etc. But they were trying out in a messy kind of way, trying out all the different things you could possibly do. And I've got that kind of cut off around the mid-2000s in terms of heaven, because after that you start to get the massive platforms which are just doing the things that massive platforms do, which I'll say a little bit about in a moment. You know, you know this already. Um, so there's that kind of beautiful time of just flourishing creativity, not really constrained by too much, not exploited too much. People doing stuff just because it's what they wanted to do, which is the kind of thing that makes me most happy. And that's what I like about creativity and agency. Um, present, as you know, uh, we do still have that, that we do still have the online spaces, of course, more than ever, where people can create and connect and exchange and have conversations and be supportive of each other and organize to do things. They do all of that, and that should make us happy, but at the same time, we tend to also dwell on all the things that make us unhappy, where we've also got vast surveillance, vast monopolies. You've got uh, exploitation, you've got all the bullying and abuse that we're certainly more aware of now, and I think there's just more of it now that you get online, and you've got both of those things. And that makes it weird, because they're both true. We tend to take quite a bowl, uh, Bowler, I was about to say, polar, binary, opposite kind of approach to these things. So the people who want to argue about how wonderful it is end up arguing with the people who want to tell you how awful it is. And that's a silly argument to be having, I think, because it's just two things. You've got a pile of good things and you've got a pile of bad things. And both of the things are true. You know, it is true that there are these online spaces, people can create and exchange, have conversations, organize to do great things, blah, blah, blah. That's all. That is the case. At the same time, all of the negative things that I just listed, they are, are also the case and are bad. Um, so you have to work out what you do with these things. And um, the pile of good things does not remedy the pile of bad things. But at the same time, the pile of bad things doesn't kill off the pile of good things or make them unimportant. So difficultly for us, I think, as academics, we have to sort of hold these two things in balance and try to work out how we can conceptualize this and what we can do about it. Um, we'd like to have big fights and decide who's right and who's wrong, but that doesn't quite work out here for those reasons. Um, <coughs> if we think about the future, which of course it's impossible to do, and I'm not going to give you any speculations about what the future is going to look like, but there, there are different ways we can get out of this fix that we're in, with in particular the massive platforms uh, sucking all of the money out of that economy and doing such, and gathering so much data about it, etc. Um, but we have to get away from things like Facebook, obviously. Um, Facebook's weird, isn't it? Because I bet most of you are on it, partly because of obligation, partly because other people are on it, and it's just a useful way to connect with people. That's all true, isn't it? But, um, but you know, when we were Growing up, if you're kind of my kind of age, we had to look at these kind of books in school, which painted dystopian visions of the future. And no one ever imagined, they, they were, you know, at least the people in those books were miserable. The world, we're, <laughs> the world we're in seems to broadly think that it's enjoying being on Facebook, but at the same time, it is literally, as you know, just a machine which purely exists to sell you to advertisers by having got as absolutely much data about you as possible in the world. Um, and especially, I think, like, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not a vegan, because being vegan is really hard. Um, and in a similar way, I'm not on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter. And you can say, well, Twitter's broadly similar, isn't it? But I think Facebook is clearly worse. But through that, <laughs> through that confluence of what they can learn about you from WhatsApp, from Instagram, Facebook itself, um, they, you know, they just hoover up so much stuff. And that is the reason why they exist. Um, You've got Mark Zuckerberg there standing in front of a slide that says data surveillance. You might think it's not really interesting. He would pose before those words. Um, that's because he was actually at a conference announcing that Facebook was going to, because of its concern for your privacy, great, great concern for your privacy, um, it was going to make sure that third-party apps couldn't do too much surveillance on you because that's Facebook's job. So, so thanks, Mark. That <laughs> They are looking after you. That's their job. Um, now, th this kind of thing, this, this, the dark side of it all, isn't really my area of research, as you may know. Um, 
again, I suppose it's a bit like being a vegetarian. I don't spend any time watching documentaries about abattoirs. I don't need to. Um, in the same way, I know these things about Facebook are true. But I think it's important to think about how we can get past this and make use of the affordances of the technologies that we have to do something better. And I think media and communications people want to be thinking about that too, don't we?